Well, here we are with lesson 28, and we're busting into a new section, section 8.3, and we will have a number of lessons in section 8.3 before we're done. So in this section, we're going to be talking about vectors. I've got a vector here for you. Notice that when we say vector PQ, we put an arrow above it. That tells us it's a vector PQ. Initial point is P, the terminal point is Q. The vector can go on, but our vector is stopping there at Q. So we're going to talk about vectors in this lesson. Let's get some terms out of the way here. A vector is a force. It has both a magnitude and direction. Very important that you know that all vectors have two components, a magnitude and a direction. The direction is indicated by the arrow, and that means what direction it's going. And the magnitude is its length. And notice how we show that. That little double bar thing on both sides means the magnitude of. In other words, we want the length of V when we ask for the magnitude. For direction, we'll normally use tangent to determine the direction. A vector that represents a push or a pull is some, uh, of, of some type is a force vector. That's mostly what we're going to be working with is our force vectors. Again, it represents a push or a pull of something, a baseball or a golf ball or, or something along those lines. It's a force vector. Now, a single force that represents the combined forces of two combined vectors is a resultant force. I might have used the word combined there too many times, but that's okay. And this happens when you hit a golf ball. The wind, you hit the golf ball, you give it a direction of magnitude, and then the wind hits it. And then where the golf ball ends up, that's a resultant force. That's mostly what we want to talk about in this lesson, our resultant forces. And we'll use the diagonal of a parallelogram uh, to determine the resultant force. Uh, each, each side of the parallelogram will represent the two forces. The diagonal will represent, will represent the resultant force. And, and we'll get into that a little later, but, but you're, you sh you'll be thinking about parallelograms between now and then. So mv is a scalar multiple of a vector v. So we gave you vector b, v, excuse me, and we want to double it or triple it. We multiply it by 2, we multiply it by 3. That's what we mean by a scalar multiple. Now if we multiply it by a positive number, m greater than 0, then it has the same direction as v. If we multiply it by a negative value for m, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, then it's a scalar multiple in the opposite direction. But you're going to like this because it's going to be a multiplication of whole numbers for the most part. This isn't too tough. And so we'll use the Cartesian plane, the xy plane, <coughs> to represent the vectors. And the numbers a1 and a2 are the components of the vector. So we give you a vector 3, 2. 3 is your a1 and 2 is your a2. Those are the components of the vector. The direction will be determined by graphing it on the Cartesian plane, the xy plane. And the magnitude will be determined by the length. And we'll use the Pythagorean theorem to determine the length. So these are all things you've done before. For instance, direction, we're going to use the tangent function, y over x. All right, let's get moving. So to find the magnitude of a vector, and notice how we signify that, double bars on, on each side there of a, uh, we will use the Pythagorean theorem. You square the x, you square the y, you add them up. And that's how we find it. Oh, I'll take square root of it. So I want to find the magnitude of the vector 4, negative 5. I'll square the x, square the y, add them up, take the square root of them. Not the most difficult math you've seen all semester or that you will see, but we get 16 plus 25, add them up, it's 41. So the magnitude, the length of vector A is the square root of 41, you know, 6 point something. Um, and that's how we find magnitude, and that's all it means. Magnitude means length. Something else we'll do is we'll add vectors. This is how we find the resultant vector. We have two vectors, we add them together, yeah, that sum is our resultant vector. Now, to add two vectors, all you do is add the x's and add the y's, and that's it. Don't overcomplicate this part of the uh, process here. So we take 2 plus 5 and get 7, and we take 4 plus negative 8, and we get negative 4. So 7, negative 4 is the resultant vector of a and b. So if we add those two together, we end up with 7, negative 4. And so if we were to draw a parallelogram using a and b as the sides, 7, negative 4 would be the diagonal. Well, that's exciting. I'll show you some, uh, some examples of that here in a minute. Well, you might guess that subtraction is the opposite of addition. So instead of adding the x's, we should track the x's. Instead of adding the y's, we should track them. So we have the vector 2, 4, 5, negative 8, and I want to subtract them. It's going to be 2 minus 5 and 4 minus a minus 8. And so 2 minus 5 is negative 3, and 4 minus a minus 8 would be a positive 12. So negative 3, 12 is the subtraction of the two vectors. And 
whereas the addition of vectors produces the resultant vector, the subtraction of vectors does not do that. Uh, but we do all sorts of things with vectors, add, subtract, multiply. And then the scalar multiples, which is multiplication. And if we multiply by a positive number, it, the, the vector stays in the same direction. So 3a would be multiplied by a positive 3. We'll get a vector three times bigger than a in the same direction. If you want to make it the opposite direction, multiply by a negative value. So if I multiply by negative 5, I make the vector five times larger in the opposite direction. And when you multiply, you simply you distribute that scalar multiple. So it's 3 times 2, 3 times negative 4, so 6, negative 12, negative 5 times 2, negative 5 times negative 4, negative 10, and 20. So that's how you multiply. So there you go. You can find the magnitude, addition, subtraction, or multiples. And this is what we do with vectors. Now there are two ways to represent vectors, and one of them we've been showing up till now is using the, the sideways carrots, it looks like coordinates 2 comma 5, 3 comma negative 7. The other way we do it is using what we call special vectors, unit vectors, i and j. And i is defined as 1 comma 0, and j is defined as 0 comma 1. And so another way that we can do this, for instance, here's a vector 2, 3, we can represent as 2i plus 3j. Or the vector 0, 5 can be represented as 5j, because it would have been 0i. Or the vector negative 3, 9 is negative 3i plus 9j. It, it, it means exactly the same thing. These are two ways to show the exact same thing, just kind of like arc tangent, inverse tangent back, back in the day. And so we just want to show you that you're going to see them interchanged. And whenever people see the ij method, a lot of times what they'll do is convert them over to the coordinates, and that's fine as well. But I want to make you aware of the fact that you're going to see both of them. All right, so let's sketch a couple of vectors, and then we're going to sketch their, their, their sum. And I'm going to show you that this forms a parallelogram, that a and b will be the sides of the parallelogram, and the diagonal will be their sum, a plus b. So vector negative 3, 4, and vector b is 4, negative 2. Let's sketch it out. And you've done this a thousand times in your life. Negative 3, 4 is down there, uh, up there, excuse me, in quadrant 2. And vector b is 4, negative 2. And it's down there in quadrant um, number 4. And now we're going to add up a and b, and we're going to sketch that one. And you add the x's and get 1, and you add the y's and you get a 2. So let's sketch a plus b, which is 1, 2. Now, you may not see it here, but that's the diagonal of the parallelogram formed by a and b. Now, parallelograms, the opposite sides are parallel, and they are congruent. So I'm going to pick up side a and duplicate it over there on b, and I'm going to do the same thing for vector b up there with side a, and I'll show you what that means. And there it is, the parallelogram formed by vectors a and b. And the diagonal there was their sum. When I added a and b, I got 1, 2, and that formed the diagonal of the parallelogram. And that works every single time. And that a plus b is the resultant vector of those two. Uh, we, we'll use uh, better examples later, but for now we're just using vectors. Well, let's do that same example uh, using a slightly different vectors. This time we're going to use the ij method. So a is 2i plus 3j, b is negative 4i plus 2j. We're going to sketch them just like you did before. We're going to sketch 2, 3, and we're going to sketch negative 4, 2. Let's look at it. And so vector a is up there in quadrant 1, 2, comma 3. Vector b is over there in quadrant uh, 2, negative 4, 2. Notice that there's not a whole lot of difference between whether we use the ij's or just the vectors. And now we're going to add them up, and we're going to sketch the resultant vector, and we're going to show you that, that is the diagonal of the parallelogram. So we add the x's and get negative 2. We add the y's and we get a positive 5. So vector a plus b is negative 2i plus 5j. So we sketch that out there at negative 2 comma 5. And then I'm going to show you that that is the diagonal of the parallelogram. And there it is. You pick up, you, what you do is you just duplicate each of the sides and you just move them over and you form the parallelogram. Opposite sides are congruent. Opposite sides are parallel. That just makes it a parallelogram. And the resultant vector, in this case, that's negative 2 comma 5, or negative 2i plus 5j, is going to be our resultant vector, the resultant of those two forces combining into one. And I just want to go through a few, um, a few more examples to make sure we can drive this home. Uh, you got two vectors here. A is 4, negative 6. B is 2, 5. And we're going to add, subtract uh, A and B, and then add, subtract 4A and 5B. 
So a plus b, add the x's, add the y's. So 4 plus 2 is 6. Negative 6 plus 5 is negative 1. And then a minus b is 4 minus 2 and negative 6 minus 5. That's not too tough. Now let's add and subtract scalar multiples of a and b. The first thing I'm going to do is find 4a and 5b. And then I'm going to really duplicate what we just did with the, uh, the first two problems here. And there, there might be a better way to do it. I, I just I'm going to find 4a, so I multiply 4 times vector a and get 16, negative 24. Multiply 5 times vector b and get 10, 25. Again, all you're doing is distributing those. Now it's much easier to add 4a and 5b and 4a minus 5b, similar to what I just did. And 16 plus 10 is 26. Negative 24 plus 25 is 1. So that's 4a plus 5b, 26, 1. And 16 minus 10 is 6. And negative 24 minus 25 is negative 49. So 4a minus 5b is 6, negative 49. Again, not the most complicated math you've seen in a while. But uh, nonetheless, this is what we do. Ah, let's do that again this time. Vector a is negative 4i minus 2j, and vector b is 6i plus 3j. Not a lot of change here. Most students would right away write negative 4 comma negative 2 and 6 comma 3 using uh, those little sideways carrots to bracket them. It's up to you how you do it. We will report our answers, though, using i's and j's, no matter how you go about uh, finding that solution. So negative 4 plus 6 is a positive 2. Negative 2 plus 3 is a positive 1. So a plus b is 2i plus j. And then subtraction, negative 4 minus 6 is negative 10. Negative 2 minus 3 is a negative 5. So a minus b is negative 10i minus 5j. Next up, I'm going to find 4a and 5b and repeat the process. So drag a 4 through the a vector and drag a 5 through the b vector. We get negative 16i minus 8j, 30i plus 5j. Now we're going to add up the x's, add up the y's, and then subtract the x's, subtract the y's. And when we do that, we end up with uh, 14i plus 7j for 4a plus 5b, and negative 46i minus 23j for 4a minus 5b. And I keep saying this, not the most difficult math in the world. Let's move on. We're going to do a couple of these problems. Uh, we're going to give you a vector. We're going to ask two questions. Find the smallest positive angle from the positive x-axis. And we're also going to find the magnitude. And those are the two things we want to do here. So here's your first vector. Negative 2 squared to 3, comma, negative 2. And that is a vector that is down there. You can see I've already sketched it for you. It's down in quadrant 3. First thing we want to do is find the magnitude of it. And so we square the x and we square the y. And when we do that, we end up with 4. That's not too tough. That's the length. That's what we mean by magnitude is the length. Next up, we want to find the least positive angle from the positive x-axis to the vector. And so I have theta in there. And we use tangent. And you notice there we've got tangent theta equals y over x. And so negative 2 divided by negative 2 squared to 3 is negative 1 over, or positive 1 over square root of 3. And we expected a positive tangent down there, didn't we? And we do the inverse tangent. Now, because that is a quadrant 3 angle, we have to add pi onto it, because the inverse tangent of a positive returns a quadrant 1 angle. But we're down in quadrant 3. So we do the inverse tangent, and we get pi over 6. But we add pi to that, and we get 7 pi over 6. So the least positive angle from the positive x-axis is 7 pi over 6. We did it. We found the magnitude, 4, and we found the least positive angle from the positive x-axis, 7 pi over 6. Let's do another one. Here, vector a is negative 2i plus 3j, so that's over in quadrant 2, negative 2, 3. We want to find the magnitude, and we want to find the least positive angle from the positive x-axis. So the magnitude of a, we square the x, we square the y, we add them up, we take the square root, and the exact value is square root of 13. Normally we ask for the exact value. If you ask for an approximated value, you can certainly use your calculator to figure that out. And so the magnitude, remember, magnitude means length. The magnitude, the length, is square root of 13. And now we're going to find the least positive angle theta from the positive x-axis to the vector. So we use tangent theta is y over x. 3 over negative 2. Make sure you get that y over x. Now, the inverse tangent of a negative returns a quadrant 4 angle, an, an acute angle down there in quadrant 4. We have to add pi to it. So the inverse tangent of negative 3 halves plus pi uh, is theta. So theta would be the inverse tangent of, or the arctangent of negative 3 halves. 
If they want the exact answer, what I have there in red is what you'll answer. Arc tan negative 3 halves plus pi. That's the exact answer. And that's in radians. Now normally, uh, and then quite often, we'll ask for the approximated angle in degrees, which you would actually use your calculator. And instead of adding pi, you would add 180 to it. And you'd get 123.7 degrees. So if the angle, if the vectors in quadrants 2 or 3, you're going to be adding pi to it. If the vectors in quadrant 1, you don't have to add anything to it. Inverse tangent, arc tangent would return the angle. If it's in quadrant 4, it's going to return a negative acute angle. You'll have to add 2 pi to swing it all the way around. And those are the exact answers. Let's move on. So before we wrap up this lesson uh, with a couple application problems, I want to review your knowledge of parallelograms. Don't forget the parallelogram, the opposite sides are congruent, B, B, A, A. The opposite angles are congruent, beta and, gamma, beta and alpha there. Here's something that a lot of people miss. The, ex consecu the consecutive angles, are, the angles that are right next to each other, uh, are, are, parallel, are supplementary. And so alpha and beta add up to 180 no matter where you're at on there. Something else, the diagonals, that's what I mean by A, C, and B, D. The diagonals are not congruent. They are not equal to each other. In a parallelogram, you have a short diagonal and you have a long diagonal. So depending on which one we're looking for, it's very important that you get it set up properly. So now that we've got our basics of parallelograms out of the way, let's move on. So we have two vectors here. Vector A is 40 pounds and vector B is 70, found, 70 pounds. And they're acting on the same point. So we're going to end up with a resultant vector here from these two and theta is the smallest positive angle between the two. So we want the magnitude or the length of the resultant force. Now in this case, that magnitude will take the, the, the units of that magnitude will be in pounds. And so what we do is we set it up. We put the 70 pound force down, we open up 45 degrees, we put down the 40 pound force, and the resultant vector is that diagonal shooting out of there. So I'm going to complete the parallelogram, and then I'm going to draw the diagonal. Now here I showed I've already drawn that diagonal, but I want to show that what's in red is the resultant. That's the, what we're looking for. Normally, you'll draw the parallelogram first. In other words, we'll pick up that 40-pound force, and we'll duplicate it over there to the right. We'll pick up the 70-pound force, we'll move it up, and we'll duplicate it up there to the top, and then you'll draw in the resultant force. And so that gives us our parallelogram. And when we want the length of R, notice R is not across from the 45 degree angle. It's across from the supplementary angle, the, the angle that's right next to the 45 degree angle, 135 degrees. So the first step in all these problems is to subtract the given angle from 180 and find the supplementary angle. That's the angle across from R. Now we have side angle side. We can use law of cosines. And so we do 40 squared plus 70 squared minus 2 times 40 times 70 cosine 135 degrees. I work from right to left, and I end up with 102.3 pounds. And so the resultant vector has a length or a magnitude of 102.3 pounds. Let's do another example. Okay, same setup. This time our two forces are 30 kilograms and 50 kilograms, and the angle between the two is 150 pounds. And again, I show the whole thing here. Normally, though, you'll duplicate the parallelogram first, then draw in that diagonal. But notice that the resultant is not across from the 150 pound, 150 degree angle. So you take 150 degrees away from 180, you get 30 degrees, and notice the 30 degrees is across from R. So there we go. We've got our side angle side, 30 kilograms, 30 degrees, and 50 kilograms. And now we'll do the law of cosines and wrap this problem up. And it's 30 squared plus 50 squared minus 2 times 30 times 50 cosine 30 degrees. You work from right to left, and you end up with 28.3 kilograms, and that is the result force. Notice you will normally, almost all the time, never use the angle they give you in your actual equation. You'll always use the angle that's supplementary to it. All right, I think that about wraps things up. Well, this concludes Lesson 28. Uh, get to work on the homework.